Welcome everyone to uh, session number three, Measuring Health Outcomes. Just to give you folks some orientation to where we are, we had talked about, remember in session one, on what Econ Eval is, comparative analysis of at least two competing alternatives. The last two sessions, and now we're moving on into outcomes. And remember when Professor McKeever talked about the majority of Econ Eval's in health is gonna be cost utility analysis. Well, that's based on, on using your outcome measure as a quality adjusted life year, which is related to, directly related to this talk. So I'm very happy to uh, present and introduce Professor Jeff Johnson, um, again, another internationally recognized professor and researcher. Um, he's known a lot for his work in diabetes, but equally um, renowned for his work with patient reported outcome measures. So with that being said, you have his biography. I won't repeat it, Jeff, the uh, stage is yours. Thanks, Thanks very much. Uh, Thanks, Andy, um, and uh, thanks for uh, attending. It, uh, when uh, I was invited, um, uh, Jasmine uh, doing the organizing said it was really sold out quickly. Um, that was before my name was even on the list, so uh, I'm assuming that there are a lot of other interesting topics. And uh, uh, so I was invited to, uh, to talk about um, um, health outcomes and in particular patient reported outcomes. And as Andy said uh, that's a, a key component of economic evaluations and we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit, but I'm gonna take it a little bit broader because there's many more applications to patient reported outcome measures in applications within the health system. So while uh, economic evaluations uh, is, is one and kind of the focus of uh, the, the overall theme, uh, I'll show some of the, the other applications that, um, that were um, we're using here in Alberta and uh, with the ministry and, and uh, with some research projects and um, particularly interested some of the work that I've done in the last few years is around the primary care environment and uh, um, PCN, um, uh, evaluating P PCN services. So um, the uh, just uh, disclosure is opening up. I will be talking a lot about uh, a measure that's known as the EQ5D and just to let you know, I, uh, this is an international research organization, a not-for-profit based in Europe, and I'm uh, on the board of directors of that, uh, that organization. Uh, uh, research funding that I have is through a number of different uh, agencies, government and, and NGO agencies. So uh, starting right at the, the top, what is a patient reported outcome measure? Very simply, it's a uh, questionnaire, an instrument, a survey that asks something about the, the patient, the, the individual to report on their own health or aspects of their health. And we will focus on typically health status or health related quality of life. So what does that mean? What does health status and health related quality of life mean? Well, you know, the standard definition that we will draw on is kind of the, the, the one that's withstood the test of time from the World Health Organization, uh, a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not just merely the absence of disease or infirmity. 1948 declaration from the World Health Organization. So it implies, or explicitly states, it's multidimensional, physical health, mental health, but also social health interacting. And, and this has, as I said, stood the test of time. It's been the standard definition of health, what health is. So it's not just not having diabetes or not just having arthritis and so on. It's, there's that positive aspect of, of health and, and well-being. The definition though has been criticized and, and people have debating it uh, that, uh, and, and some extensions might be uh, from individuals like Talcott Parsons, a, a sociologist who takes the view of capacity. Health is a state of optimum capacity to do the things that are important to you that you value. John Ware is uh, an, a social psychologist. Um, you may have heard of the SF36, SF12. John Ware was one of the original developers of the, uh, the SF instruments. Uh, and uh, he kind of um, distinguishes the within the skin from the outside the skin. So he comes back to the WHO definition, a physical and mental that's within the skin, but that's social interaction. So there, there's typically been this uh, extension um, uh, around from that physical, mental, social well-being to what's important, how do people value what they, their health state is. Okay, so it's a site, the distinction there is 
kind of the health state, what state you're in, a physical, mental, and social state, versus the value that you place on that state. Okay? So different people put different value on a health state. I look around the room, like me, some people are, have a, uh, a problem with vision. And that's a health state, a decrement in your health. Normal vision would be full health, but having to wear corrective lenses is a decrement in your health. Some people are okay with that, some people are vain uh, and don't want to wear glasses and they have surgery or for whatever reason. So people have different values for a state of health and choose to do different things depending on their value. Some people are vain like me and go buy really expensive glasses that kind of flash a little bit. So <laughs> it's the value that people put on the state they're in. Okay? So that's a distinction, being in a health state and then how much you care about being in that health state, the value. And that's a distinction I make between health status and health-related quality of life. Health status is descriptive. Health-related quality of life puts a value on that description. And that's a key, key distinction that I use in, in those terminologies. But when you go read the literature, even sometimes what I write, it gets blurred back and forth. But uh, to, to help with the, the, the messaging, the, the teaching, I, I try to make those distinctions. Health status descriptive, health related quality of life, valuation. So um, different models, that this got a little smaller than what I originally uh, put it on, but um, some models of, of this extension of the WHO definition that health is quite a, a broad range from biological function and when you have derangements of biologic function, that gives rise to symptoms. Symptoms may affect your functional status. Your functional status may affect your health perceptions and that may affect your overall health-related quality of life. So there's this hierarchy from the biology to the perceptions and the valuations. That was the original model by Wilson and Cleary, uh, uh, 1995, and uh, Ferrand's in a, um, um, it was a journal of, of uh, nursing scholarship, I think, kind of added these uh, external characteristics of the individual and characteristics of the environment. So this chain, this hierarchy of the body is also influenced by characteristics of the individual, so the aging or personality, those types of characteristics, but it's also influenced by the environment, the social environment, the social determinants of health. Okay. So this is a more comprehensive model. This is kind of what now is, uh, has emerged as the defining model of taking from the WHO to this kind of hierarchical uh, linking biology to perceptions with the social uh, and individual determinants of health. A little more comprehensive. So you can imagine the measurement then is, uh, um, is, gets complicated. Biologic function, we measure that with physiologic measures. We get that data into the laboratory, uh, blood pressure or kidney function, that's biologic function. Then symptoms are reported uh, or um, uh, complaints uh, for individual patients which um, may or may not be perceived by the same way to affect their functional status. So decreased vision uh, and uh, this problem, the biologic function is the lens that has uh, reduced uh, um, biologic uh, or symptoms, blurred vision, uh, the functional status being able to see uh, or, or read and so on. Okay? And does that bother your health and, and what, uh, how much value do you place on it? Will you do something about it? Will you change? Will you invest in some corrective lenses or surgery? <coughs> so that's kind of the, the broad range. And why do we, you know, coming from that, why are, why are we interested in that last end, that perceptions and, and the, the health-related quality of life? Well, um, you know, the standard uh, quality, um, quality metrics, the uh, Health Quality Council here, you know, if we're, we're trying to provide patient-centered care, then we should care what the patient cares about. Um, so it's a key element, the, the uh, acceptability uh, of, uh, of services. 
And the other uh, important feature we know in healthcare were uh, chronic diseases, especially as Andy said, I uh, have focused a lot around diabetes, uh, obesity as, uh, a, as a clinical area of, of research. Chronic diseases like that or any chronic disease has a huge self-care component. And so we need to know, we need to measure that patient aspect of, of health. Uh, what they do for their own health and what they perceive as the, their health outcome. From a more organizational, you've, you've heard, I'm sure, the, the triple aim uh, of uh, trying to improve health, uh, have positive patient experience while managing the cost of care. So uh, health outcomes, patient experience, uh, health outcomes very broad across that biology to the um, per, uh, perceptions and health-related quality of life, but patient experience has emerged uh, as an important outcome in and of itself, patient satisfaction. And, uh, so the, uh, that side of the, the triangle is also a patient reported uh, measure of health as well. Okay, so I mentioned there's a number of different applications. We'll talk about uh, uh, some of these, but uh, measuring population health in and of itself, independent of any economic considerations, just what is the health of the population? How do subpopulations differ from other subpopulations? How do Western Canada populations differ from Eastern Canadian populations. So from a descriptive point of view, uh, we, we're interested in respondents, uh, individuals, the population's own health status in that comparison. Also, uh, a, a nice, uh, a new area that's really developing uh, is in direct patient care. How can PROMS, patient reported outcome measures, be used in the direct care provided for patients? And we'll talk a little bit about that. The overall quality of the health system, overall performance, and economic evaluations. These are all different applications. We'll show a few examples of these. So patient-reported outcome measures, PROMS, we're typically, as I say, talking about health-related quality of life, but PREMS is the, the acronym you, you may have heard. It's emerging uh, on that other side of the triple aim, uh, patient-reported experience measures. So again, patient-reported, getting their assessment of the health care provision. You know, so we used to call them satisfaction surveys, now they're called PREMS to have a nice matching acronym for the PROMS and PREMS. Um, but patient report outcome measures would also be the self-reported behaviors, which our health system isn't very good at measuring, despite the fact that self-care is an important aspect of health care. And uh, what some of the things we're interested in doing is incorporating more of self-reported health behaviors what do people do for their physical activity? What do they do for their diet, smoking behaviors, and so on? Incorporating that into our health system performance evaluation because you need that part for an efficient health system as well. And so those are patient-reported outcome measures as well that are not typically captured very well. But We'll talk about the PROMs. We'll focus on the PROMs, the patient report outcome measures. We'll focus on health status, health-related quality of life. So the types of measures that we typically use uh, could be classified as um, generic measures or specific measures. Generic measures, the name would imply, can be used in all different applications. So generic measures of health typically are measuring those broad dimensions, physical, mental, and social health. And they could be used to measure health status in the general population, in a population with diabetes, population <coughs> with asthma, with cancer. They apply broadly across any population and they allow for comparisons across any population. As opposed to specific measures which can't be used across any population because they're focused in on the aspects of health that are particularly relevant for a specific population. Okay. That specific population might be defined by the characteristics of the population, the age characteristics, so child-specific measures or elderly-specific measures, or it might be defined by a disease, a specific disease like a diabetes-specific quality of life measure, asthma quality of life, cancer, in which case it wouldn't make much sense to use an asthma-specific quality of life measure to measure the health of the population in Alberta. 
because it doesn't apply the questions that it's going to ask, the aspects of asthma-related quality of life are not going to apply to most of the population who don't have asthma. Okay. The benefit is a, a specific measure may get more um, responsiveness or be able to pick up differences that are unique to that condition and may be responsive to treatments, for example. But on the other hand, you lose some of that comparability to evaluate and to compare. Another type of specific measure that's getting very, very specific would be a symptom specific measure. And it doesn't matter what disease it's in, but um, pain, for example, uh, a pain specific measure. And this, uh, the disease specific measures and condition uh, uh, or uh, symptom specific measures is kind of the growth area in the health status, health related quality of life measures. There's always seems to be new <coughs> measures being developed to measure a specific symptom or a specific um, um, disease. Uh, and that tends to be um, driven a lot by uh, the um, pharmaceutical industry, uh, that they have a new drug coming out that has a particular effect or a particular area, so they want to develop a measure that helps them um, show benefit in that particular area. The generic measures, we've kind of got a, a stable of generic health status measures, health related quality of life measures that are quite familiar and, and used in a lot of applications around the world. So there's not as much development of new instruments in that. So that's one way to classify measures, is whether they're generic or specific. Another way is the type of data that they produce. As an instrument, as a survey, a questionnaire, you get responses and then they are typically created, uh, data that's created is, could either be a, a single index, one overall score that represents all aspects of health, so if you have a, a generic instrument that measures physical, mental, and social health, and it condenses it all down to a single score that tells you what the overall health of that individual is. That would be called an in index score. Versus a profile which says, well, there's physical health, and let's get a score for physical health. And then there's mental health, so let's get a separate score for mental health, and we'll keep them separate so that we can see how people are feeling overall, or is it a difference between their physical or mental health? The index score mashes it all together, so you might not be able to tell if somebody has a low score, is it because their mental health's low or is their physical health low? Okay, so that's one of the downsides of the index score. Benefit of having a profile score is you can look more detail where their health might be high or low or where their treatment effect might be of a, of a drug or a, a, a therapy. The downside of that, however, is if one side's good and one side's bad, then is the person better off? So it's sometimes it's nice to have a single overall score that tells you, are they better off? So there's pros and cons, and therefore, when we are conducting a study or doing an evaluation, we often recommend, well, it'd be nice to get a generic and a specific measure because you get a really broad picture of the health of that patient population and allows you to compare to other populations. And if you could get a profile and an index measure, then you can make decisions about their net overall health, but you can get information about where their health is most affected. Fortunately, that doesn't necessarily mean four different measures. Uh, those characteristics overlap, so you can have generic profile and index measures or uh, specific profile or index measures. So you can, um, despite what we try to do in academia is try and get as much measurement and longest survey you could possibly get, you can sometimes um, be a little more efficient and, and get better measurement with a fewer number of measures. So SF36 is one that you'll uh, have heard of or SF12, a short version, and EQ5D are probably the world's most um, commonly used measures for uh, uh, health status. Both of these are generic health status measures. They're used in many, many different populations. The index scores that we, we get, that single index score, like uh, from an, uh, an EQ5D uh, or other measures, we can get a single score from something that's just a simple rating. So if I gave you a visual analog scale with zero at the bottom and 100 at the top and said, how do you feel today? 
you give me a number on that, I call that a rating. Versus uh, the um, more complex measures, uh, standard gamble time trade-off are, are two complex interviews, or the SF 6D or EQ 5D, which are survey questionnaires, just like the, the, um, the SF 36. I ask a whole bunch of questions, and then I, I get a score overall from a scoring formula that gives me that overall index score. And it combines all of these different health states. The scoring system that's generated has been created based on comparisons, relative comparisons of different health states. So we call those preferences because, like I said, some people have a different level of preference. They value their health state a little bit more. The rating just says, this is my health. Doesn't it doesn't have any comparison. But the EQ5D has a scoring system that says this health state is this much better than another health state and therefore your score will be this. So it's not your values but the kind of the scoring algorithms values and I'll show you how that works with a, a slide. Okay, so measures like that, the EQ5D which is one that's uh, been used a lot here in the province uh, has two components, a, a survey questionnaire that describes the health state and then a, a scoring system, a value set that generates an overall index score. Okay, so it has the, that profile component uh, uh, that describes the health state but it also has an index score. So it's got both of those elements in one measure. Okay. So the SF60, another measure like the Health Utilities Index, or, so the SF60 is a, another type of measure that comes from the SF36. These are all similar types of, of measures. They're based on a, a questionnaire with a number of different health state descriptions and then have a scoring system. <clears throat> so multidimensional health states, scoring system. A key feature of the scoring system that's really important for the economic evaluations is that they integrate mortality and morbidity. Okay, so that means in the scale, in the score that you get, dead is somewhere on that score. Mor that's mortality. Okay, so typically that's a score of zero. Zero to one is a typical score. Zero is a health state dead. One is a full health. Okay, so the measurement then can integrates both morbidity and mortality. From zero to one tells you what level of health and functioning do you have. Somebody has died, they get a score of zero. Okay. It also implies in the scoring system that some people have a negative score. Some people's health state will be negative. And that often brings up some odd looks. Has anyone heard of a concept of euthanasia? That's the demonstration of that concept. People feel the health state they're in could be improved by dying. That's what these scales and scores are, that there's anchored at zero, not that's the bottom of the scale, but it's just an anchor at zero. One is full health. But a negative score implies a health state that's considered worse than dead. And we know that that is something that in the general population, people feel that is a concept that's important. So the instruments like the EQ5D and HUI allow people in the general population to express that value of a health state. A health state that's so poor that generally people think it would be better to, it would improve their health to go to zero. And I think euthanasia is the embodiment of that concept that there are people who view that that is a, uh, a better health outcome. And it's those considerations that allow us to uh, um, incorporate health outcomes into economic evaluation through this concept of a, a quality adjusted life year. Okay. You've heard of that concept through the cost utility analysis. It's a very, very simple concept. If you take a health state on this scale, zero being dead, one being full health, say it's 0.65, and 
and you live in that health state for eight years, a quality is just an area under the curve. It's just that area. So you multiply 0.65 times eight, and then you get 5.2 qualies, 5.2 quality adjusted life years, which is interpreted as living in that health state, valued at 0.65, living in that health state for eight years is the same as living in full health for 5.2 years. Just a simple product, a simple mathematical product. Of course, people's lives don't typically go like that. Um, there's ups and downs in health and, uh, and declines. But, and so mathematically, it's calculated as kind of an area under the curve. And the more frequent measurements you have, the more precise that area under the curve you can estimate. But conceptually, it's just that area under the curve. And therefore, in a cost utility analysis, you compare the qualities that are accumulated from one treatment to the qualities that are accumulated in another treatment. That's qualities gained. And the, it's just a mathematical difference between them in that quality gain comparison. Okay. So the issue is, is this measurement. This is the PROM measurement that we incorporate. So how do we, we get that? Okay. So EQ5D is the example I'll, I'll use uh, a lot. It's a generic preference-based measure, provides that index score. Those are the descriptors uh, uh, that, that I used. And it's a measure of health-related quality of life. It's also a measure of health status. Okay, it's my two distinctions. So it measures health status and it measures health-related quality of life. Okay, the health status is measured by the descriptive system. So it has five dimensions, mobility, self-care, usual activities, pain, discomfort, anxiety, and depression. And it asks people to uh, rate your level of functioning on one of five levels. I've got another slide that'll show it a little bit more. Okay. And so the way people respond to that is a health state. What's your level of functioning on mobility? Is it, is it uh, um, no problem, some problem, extreme problem? That's just a descriptive health state. Okay, so it, that five dimensions gives a health status measurement. We also ask with the EQ5D uh, a visual analog scale rating. So uh, you're asked to rate on a visual analog scale anchored at zero being the worst health you can imagine, 100 being the best health you can imagine. How would you rate your health? And in this, a respondent decides what's important to them. This part has been decided on these five dimensions, what's your health status. But in this, it's what you think is important, what you want to rate as your health. So it can capture more than just anxiety and depression, pain, discomfort, and so on. Okay, so both elements are, are part of that. There's actually um, three different versions of the EQ5D. Um, some of you working in this field for some time may remember uh, the EQ5D in its original format. It had three levels on each of the five dimensions. Okay, so uh, if you do uh, three to the level five, that works out to 243 health states, unique health states by the combinations of those three dimensions across the five levels. Okay. So how many health states are there in life? Probably more than 243. That's one of the major limitations of the EQ5D. It's really simple. It's almost too simple to imagine measuring health. But in fact, it was used for many years. But the, uh, the, the Iroquois group, um, one of the major problems when we'd use it in population health surveys in particular, that you'd ask people to rate this. And most of the population, kind of 50% 50, 50 of the population, would say they have no problems on all of the dimensions. So it's not very. Um, fine in its measurement, and you can't describe a population. And if somebody says they have no problems on all of the dimensions, and you give them a treatment, you can't get any improvement. So it's got limited responsiveness to measuring any change. So one of the revisions recently was just uh, introduced a few years ago is to go from three levels to five levels by inserting two levels in between of those original three. So now we, we talk about the three level, three L and five L of the EQ5D and this is by far much more um, commonly used now. 
um, because it provides more information, more measurement. Okay, so five levels, five dimensions, 3,125 health states, unique health states. Okay. Is that enough? Probably not. Still pretty simple, still pretty gross, but better. Okay. Depending on the population, there's data from uh, Japan where the three-level version uh, in used in population surveys, you get about 70, 75 percent of the population who say they're in perfect health. Okay. So kind of, um, um, social, cultural differences in, in reporting health and problems, that three-level version has, has a lot of measurement limitations. So we, we've shifted a lot to the five-level uh, version to describe health. There's also been a, a, a youth version, um, youth-friendly version that was developed uh, originally based on the, the, the three-level, and so uh, it's still a three-level. Uh, we're working on a five-level version now, but it, it's just simpler wording that was aimed at adolescents and has been used. Here in Alberta, we've been using EQ5DY, the youth version, in uh, one of the projects that's been running out of the school of public health with uh, Apple Schools, some of you may have heard of it, or Real Kids Survey. Uh, so one of my colleagues is, is surveying um, grade five students in Alberta and has been, over the years, collecting um, health status data using the, the EQ5DY. Interestingly, we're exploring, and a number of people are uh, looking at EQ5DY as a measure of adult health status um, because it's just simpler to read. Uh, so why not use the simpler version for adults, especially if there's a, a lower literacy uh, or cognitive limitations and so on. So, so the, the revisions to it is just the language version, the language, uh, not anything, any other conceptual difference. So, uh, and as I say, we're, uh, the group is working on a, a five-level version for the very same reasons of uh, improving the measurement space or what's captured with the descriptive system. Uh, and so the visual analog scale, just a, a bit more of the, uh, uh, what the description, uh, the instructions are. And uh, so what you get from that, this instrument, is, is uh, three different data elements. So you get the profile. Like I said, there's a health profile. You get information on the five dimensions and describes a health state. You get the visual analog scale score, but you also get this index score that uh, will incorporate into economic evaluation. So the profile gives, we can use it in a lot of different ways. Commonly what's uh, used, especially in population health surveys, is you might dichotomize it. You might look at respondents on each of the levels, but one way that's been presented is if people say they're in level one on that dis dimension, they have no problem. And levels two, three, four, and five are problems, um, but you could split it at any way uh, you want or any categories you want. Uh, this is data uh, that's available in, with Health Quality Council has been using the EQ5D uh, in some of their uh, surveys, the patient experience survey uh, over the past few years. Um, and uh, on uh, the, we've worked with them to do population norms for the five-level version. So the five dimensions, and it's split by problems and no problems, so level one versus two, three, four, or five. And then just the number of people uh, responding to each of these dichotomies across all ages. Okay, so it's just a, a count of the, uh, an indication of the level of problems on a particular dimension. Gives you some information about the health status. The visual analog scale, again, the instructions, you can ask people to rate. They might say, okay, well, my score today is 95 on a 0 to 100 scale. And that, um, the, the third piece is um, the, the index score. And this is where it's a little more complicated, so, uh, and this is where it gets into the economic evaluation. So the five dimensions, if we have asked people to indicate what their health status is on those five dimensions, we turn that into a, a description by saying, well, that's mobility level two, self-care level one, usual activities level one, pain discomfort level three, anxiety and depression level four. So uh, I am severely anxious or depressed. Level three is I have moderate pain or discomfort. Okay, so we would call that a health state two, one, one, three, four. So it's just a vector, a descriptor of those five dimensions, each of the levels on those five dimensions. So that describes a health state. If I see somebody that's level four 
with anxiety and depression, I know they've got, you know, severe mental, they're reporting that they have severe mental health issues. But it doesn't affect their usual activities, it doesn't affect their self-care activities. So you have this profile information. So we can take that score and we can apply a scoring system, which the citations there, uh, it's a study that we, I was involved in that we did across Canada. We had respondents, we did interviews in Vancouver, in Edmonton, in Toronto, and in Montreal. 1,200 interviews overall using a, a time trade-off interview and ask people to rate all these, uh, a subset of those 3,125 health states. And then we created a scoring system based on those responses that looks like this. So then I take this health state and I plug it into the formula. So level two, level one, level one, level three, and level four. And then these are kind of scores that bring the score down when there's really severe level four, level five on any of those dimensions. If you plug the score, uh, the formula in, uh, the state into the formula, and you get an overall index score on that zero to one scale, 0 0.5807. So this health state, 21134, descriptively, gets an index score of 0.581. That's based on the respondents from across the country, how they view this health state compared to all the other health states that are described. Okay, so it's a preference-based score on the general population's preference. Okay, it's not the individual's valuation of their health, it's the general population. The rationale for that, when this score goes into an economic evaluation, whose tax dollars are being spent? In a resource allocation decision, it's the general tax dollars. So we invite the general preferences for health. Yes? Dr. Dawson, uh, one thing I'm looking at uh, is the point zero eight five uh, number four or five squared. Would that not be one squared in, in that there's one in four? Or It's uh, the number of level four or fives beyond the first. Okay. So that's the definition of that. Uh, so you're talking about this particular? This, that one, yeah. yeah. So it's defined as the number level fours or five beyond the first one. Okay. So one level four is bad. Right. Another level four or five is bad, but it's not as bad as one. So two is not as bad as one. So it's a, it's a, it's a nonlinear term to uh, account for that. Uh, um, declining. Okay. okay, so that's the score that's then used in that quality calculation. So that's the score that goes on that vertical axis of health multiplied by the number of years that uh, the people are, are in their health. Okay, so the range of being really bad, level five, gets a score of 0.148. Okay, so that's worse than dead. According to the Canadian general population, level five on all those dimensions would be worse than dead by that much, which is a really odd concept. Um, and we've been trying to do some qualitative work about what that means. You know, how dead is dead uh, is the question we've been asking people. Um, and you can imagine how difficult that is for people to discuss with us. Terrible academics. Okay, so applications. And I'm gonna, uh, just in the time we have, um, kind of flip through these. Uh, evaluating the effectiveness of services. Um, looking at assessing population health, informing clinical practice, or economic evaluation. <coughs> so this is just a, an example of uh, a, a randomized control trial, two randomized control trials of a, a drug, a rhomboplastin for um, immune uh, or idiopathic thrombocytopenia. So a, it's a, a, you could pick any number of, of uh, conditions and, and trials. There's randomized trials. Health outcomes, PROMs, are increasingly used as outcome measures in these uh, to, uh, to justify, to show that there's a health-related quality of life benefit as well as perhaps the clinical benefit. Uh, and uh, so these were uh, randomized trials using the three-level version of the EQ5D. And uh, the blue is the placebo group. The gray is the um, um, treatment, active treatment group. And in the papers, uh, there's a mean change on the index score of 0 0.05 got better on the drug and a 0 0.03 got uh, score decline on placebo, which was statistically significant. 
the visual analog scale score improved by 0 .6 or 6.42, and uh, there was really no change in the placebo that wasn't statistically significant. So, but the conclusion was that the, the drug improved health related quality of life. So as an outcome in a clinical trial um, is, is one application. In population health, I'd mentioned the Health Quality Council uh, data. So if, uh, you go to the Health Quality Council website, Health Outcome Measures. Uh, we've been working with them for a number of years. This is an earlier report on the norms, the population norms for the three level version of EP5B. <coughs> so that profile uh, data I showed you earlier was the five level version from a more recent survey. This is the visual analog scale, uh, sorry, the index score for men and for women in different age groups. And you can see uh, younger age groups, the overall score is about 0 0.92, 0.91. As we age, our health typically declines. This suggests that women over the age of 65 are reporting a much lower health status than men. That's because men lie about their health a lot. <laughs> um, typically, there's much less mental health stress and, and so on. So we either are healthier or we lie, uh, is, is kind of the interpretation you should get from that. Um, uh, Alberta Health, uh, um, working with uh, Larry Svensson, Doug Dover, uh, have uh, uh, the uh, Alberta Community Health Survey has also included EQ5B in their population health. So 2014, the first wave, there's about 70, uh, 7,600 uh, respondents. So no problem, some problem. That's that same level one versus level two, three, four, and five on anxiety and depression for men and women. And again, you can see that um, women are reporting more problems, almost 40%, versus men, about 34%, who report problems, any level of problems. Okay, but if you broke it down by level two and level three and level four and level five, you'll see even more of a separation. So it's just descriptive of the profile, just of the mental health aspect. This is a report just came out uh, last month that uh, um, uh, Larry Svensson Shop did using that data, uh, using that Alberta Community Health Survey data, the population health status measure, and calculated a quality adjusted life expectancy based on the residual life expectancy stratified by income. Okay, so we're using the population health data to look at income inequality in life expectancy but also quality adjusted life expectancy. So a quality could also be calculated <coughs> not just as a life year, but the rest of your life, a quality adjusted life expectancy. Okay. Public Health Agency of Canada has been doing some reports like this and, and we're using the same type of data here in Alberta and, uh, and using it in this case to, to, uh, to demonstrate that, that income inequality in health. Okay, so a population health status. Clinical practice, this is a, an interesting area. This is uh, some, we're collaborating with some people at the uh, ABJHI, Alberta Joan and Bone and Joint Health. Uh, people who are undergoing hip or knee replacement uh, in the province are getting PROM measurement before they come in for surgery and then after they have their surgery. And uh, this being used across the province by ABJHI to look at the describing the population that comes in. So this is the three level version. Red is uh, uh, the extreme problems. Yellow is moderate problems. Green is no problems by the, uh, within the population, just on the pain discomfort. So the, and I think it's by uh, the regions, South Calgary and uh, overall. So you can start to see some difference. Edmonton has fewer people in moderate that are going in for surgery. So there's differences in the intake in different regions of the province on a level of pain and discomfort. Okay. This is a, a graph that just shows, uh, this was their pre-surgery score and this is their post-surgery score. This is actually on the WOMAC, Western Ontario McMaster Arthritis Scale. So it's a condition specific measure that they're using as well. And uh, shows that the majority of people, their score is low uh, to begin with, but after surgery it's high. That's a good thing. But there's some people who are, have a high score to begin with and they have a low score uh, after surgery. 
That's not so good. After surgery, if you still have, if you have more pain than when you went in, that's not a good outcome. Or there's a lot of people up here that had high functioning, high, they had poor, uh, pretty good arthritis symptoms. They weren't really a problem. And after surgery, they're about the same. That's not very good either. Are those the people who should be getting surgery or should we put s people in surgery who benefit more? Okay, so start to inform those types of management decisions, triaging, choosing patients, and to predict. So using the data to say, okay, what is it that predicts their outcome? And uh, here again, Womack, a significant predictor pre-surgical Womack is a stronger predictor of their post-surgery. So their health status predicts the outcome. But what's really interesting now is we're starting to look at applications of using that type of data that's been collected over years to inform, help patients make decisions. And this is a pilot project uh, we're involved with, um, with the Bone and Joint Institute. For about seven years, ABJHI has been collecting PROMS data, EQ5D and WOMAC. We're using that data now to feed into a decision aid that's presented to patients that says, Patients like you, your age and your health status to begin with, this is what their outcome was if they went for surgery. And this is what their outcome was if they took medical management. What do you want to do? Okay, so using that PROMS data and the feeding it back into helping improve decision making in healthcare and involving the patient in making the decision, engaging that patient a bit more. And this is a new and, and developing area and so we're actually developing this tool and then piloting it because uh, we don't know for sure if that's going to help. And of course, like many things we do in healthcare, it seems like a good idea, but we want to put some research behind it to see if it's worth it uh, to, to make that, uh, that effort. Some of you may have, uh, be aware of uh, probably the biggest effort in PROMS in the health system is, is in the NHS in the UK. This is a, a, a book by uh, uh, John App Appleby, Nancy Devlin, Dave Parkin. And uh, they go through uh, what's been done with the PROMS program in the UK in the NHS, National Health Service, and uh, developed for patients to help inform and, and make choices for clinicians, uh, hospitals, and commissioning bodies uh, to evaluate the services. You can actually go, the NHS measures PROMS, again, on people that are going through elective surgeries, so hip and knee, um, hernia operations, varicose vein operations, that's those four operations are the focus. They get a survey before they have surgery, they have their surgery and they get a survey about six months later. That data is collated by the NHS and it's put on their website. So a patient could go to the website, the NHS website and said, I'm planning to have my uh, hip replaced. I live about in an area, there's about four hospitals. This hospital has this outcome, this hospital has that outcome, this hospital has that outcome. I could choose which hospital I went to, want to go to based on the PROMS. So it's information about choosing the services okay. and what the outcomes are. So for groin, hernia, hip replacement, knee replacement, varicose veins, there's an EQ5D and a condition specific measure. So for hip replacement, the majority of people get better. Knee replacement, the majority of people get better. Hernia operations, kind of like a 50-50. So outcomes helping to assess that. Uh, I'm going to skip over this in the interest of time. Um, but as we said, we'll share the papers with you. Um, and this is uh, the, the other area. We're using it measures now in decision, uh, in communication. PROMS uh, research, uh, a this is a trial in oncology that showed if you incorporate a PROM measure into a clinical practice, that helps the patient engage the clinician in conversation. Discussions are better. There's more communication and that helps improve patient experience as well. Um, in the interest of time, I don't have to cover it. This is a summary of, of a lot of evidence that's gen coming out about that. How do we improve communication? How do patients and providers use PROMS in clinical practice? And the last is, uh, is the qualities, getting into the economic evaluation and that measure of quality, two different measures of quality, and you get the incremental difference. My slides muddled up a little bit. And this is an example 
a paper that we just published of a study we did in primary care networks in Alberta, about four primary care networks around Edmonton. We implemented a program that screened for depressive symptoms in people with type 2 diabetes and then provided, a nurse provided a, a, a case management strategy, dealt with that uh, patient on an individual level, had care plans, had some follow-up. And we used the outcome measures EQ5D, measured at six, uh, 0, 6 and 12 months. And then we did an economic evaluation that showed this um, collaborative care model had a incremental cost utility ratio of $24,000. And if you compared that to, um, to a different level of care by just screening and telling the doctor that this patient has mental health issues, not actually doing case management, that was even more cost effective from a, uh, a ratio below that ratio that we typically look at, like a $50,000 per quality adjusted life year. So again, using the EQ5D as an outcome measure, incorporating into an economic evaluation, comparing the cost, you get this incremental cost, which I know you've talked about in other applications. I didn't go through it in detail. So uh, just to wrap up for a, a question or two, this is the uh, last thing is just, uh, we just established a, a, a new unit, uh, APERSU. Alberta PROMS and EQ5D research and support units, funded by Health Quality Council, funded by Alberta Health Services, not yet funded by Alberta Health. Um, <laughs> but we're here to support the people in the province using the EQ5D. And um, that includes Alberta Health, Alberta Health Services, the primary care network. So we're, we're there to help provide a lot of support in how to use the measures, how to interpret it, how to calculate those types of, uh, of index scores. So with that, I will, uh, be quiet and uh, see if there's any questions. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks,